know, I had a couple run-ins with the cops and stuff. So you had a missing persons report at 13? By the time I was 18, I've already been shot at. I've been stabbed. They were worried I was going to be Dahmer by 25. They told me that when I was in there. It doesn't matter what, what you have or where you're from. It matters your character. Hey guys, this is Aless. Welcome back to my channel. So here we have another episode of the Breaking the Silence. I'm going to put the links of the other ones I've done down below. I just want to give a bit of a disclaimer slash trigger warning. This conversation or this episode rather is very heavy. Some of the topics that are going to be discussed can be distressing to some people. It can be very triggering. So I just kind of wanted to give you guys a heads up. One more thing. I had to censor out a lot of words, as you can see, due to YouTube's new strict policies. The format that I'm doing it now with the full screen, the music, is something that I only recently thought about. I wish I had done this from the start, but I just it just didn't come to my head at that moment. But I will probably continue like this from now on if I get more people that want to come on. So without further ado, let's get on with this interview. Hey there guys, my name's Darkson, just some white guy from the Great White North, 28 years of age. It's a pleasure to be here and talking with y'all. Yes, this is our Canadian fellow, a fellow Canadian. So Darkson, share a little bit about yourself and what you have gone through. I'm a guy from pretty humble beginnings there. Parents started out with without much of anything. You know, we were uh, brought up in the hood originally. Struggled quite a bit, but they did what they can. They eventually made it out of it, but by that time, I was already out and doing my thing. I was brought up in environments that were quite diverse and was exposed to all sorts. It's quite interesting. I've always been a little bit different and a little bit of a sh**. We'll get into why that is a little bit later there, but, you know, it really went downhill when I was about 12, 13. Ended up getting exposed to uh, pot, alcohol, coke, and by the time my 13th birthday was around. Being a young kid hooked up on that, it was devastating mentally. Stuff happened with that. The people that uh, I got that through ended up uh, being dealt with. So I didn't have access for quite a while and I was going through withdrawals while the court stuff was going on. After that was all done, I, I started running away. I couldn't handle it. You know, there was some other outside stuff that happened with my family and my folks were managing and mitigating that and you know i'm so glad that they did because my other siblings were affected in ways that were traumatic and needed attention wow. the shit that was happening with me the unresolved mental health stuff and the withdrawals from such heavy chemical drugs yeah. uh it sent me for a loop and i just i couldn't be at home so i started running away and couch hopping and surfing for a bit till uh my missing persons report went out and then from there i uh i hit the streets so you had a missing persons report at 13. yeah 13 14. Wow. within six months of uh the court case residing and uh me leaving i just i couldn't handle it i was fed up they were looking for me i was bouncing around between my hometown and the surrounding areas there after they found you and did they like bring you home once or twice they brought me back and then eventually uh the last couple times they brought me back to my grandma's but i wasn't in the right space to be around all that and i was so deep in at that point all i really cared about was getting high and making money you know just being a little hood rat and street rat at that point i just didn't care i was out of school at that point uh I dropped out second semester grade nine ended up responding to an incident that was ongoing for years from uh middle school on to high school a bunch of guys ended up cornering me and fucking around so i ended up showing them i wasn't taking it anymore held him against the wall with a kniff and made him his pants as he ran to the principal's office so i got expelled and or not expelled uh, suspended for a bit there and sent to a remedial school that i just didn't go to you see that happening a lot with, you know, teens, you know, getting into this stuff and things like this happening and circumstances like this. Did anyone try to help you or show you that they were there for you at all? Oh, 100%. Like, my folks, as taxed as they are, I'm sure they tried the best they could. And there were family, friends, and people that reached out, you know, like, we had some. But at that point, like, I was, I didn't want any of that help. And I, with the was on, I was just so into it. I didn't care. I didn't have a reason to care. The only thing that I felt I was in control with was what I was doing on the day to day and the amount of pain I could put, I was in. So, and like kind of uh, slicing and burning. You know, I saw the scars all over. 
it was a rough time. Did a lot of things I was I'm not proud of that uh, to keep afloat. I was as I was on the streets there. You know, can't blame a man for going for a low if he's hungry kind of deal. You know. Wow, I can't I can't even imagine like like no I I genuinely mean this like I just. <sighs> oh, I was I was a bit of a brat before that exposure though too. I I was a little bit of a klepto when I was uh, eleven to twelve there to try to gain people's approval because I was no cast, you know, like I, I was really good at being, re I'm a really big guy. Like, you know, I'm six, three, but if I don't want to be seen, no one's seeing me. And I was able to lift. Sh it was just unremarkable for anybody my age, you know? So I, I did stuff like that to get in with the wrong circles and crowds and then the exposure to drugs. So I was already in, in an, I was already inclined to be an asshole. You know, I had a couple run-ins with the cops and stuff, a couple slaps on the wrist and returns of stuff that I got caught with. I attribute a little bit of that to my uh, my mental health there, the diagnosis that I didn't get all situated till I was like 19, 20, but. And what was the diagnosis again? Uh, Antisocial personality disorder. I think like 2% of the population is actually diagnosed with it. So you know how you have like a conscience that like, when you do something wrong or that hurts somebody that you know is wrong, you feel that little pang in your chest or your stomach or your head, and you feel that little voice, that Jiminy Cricket that tells you, hey, you're being a asshole. Don't have it. I was born without it. It wasn't something that was trauma-induced, like with what people would consider like psychopaths. Usually they're delusional and their mind's broken by a traumatic event. So they develop these sort of similar capacities to what I have with mice uh disorder but it's not exactly the same like i don't have you know delusions or dreams or ideas of grandeur or the associated narcissistic traits i just the decision to hug you and hit you affects me the same i don't really care and i enjoy hitting you actually a little bit more because i enjoy inflicting pain it's just one of the twisted little things about me i've had to reform and deal with to become a decent member of society. I ended up figuring out I had this condition by uh, admitting myself into a psych ward. And I was there for around two weeks as they did some scans and tests and told me what, what was wrong with me and what parts of my disorder I actually had symptomology wise. Cause my disorder is pretty broad and includes like a lot, just it's kind of whack in my opinion. But thankfully, I was brought up with a strong ethical and moral code by my father, like from an outside source that was drilled intrinsically. So, you know, they were worried I was going to be Dahmer by 25. They told me that when I was in there. Wow. Just because of my total disregard for the causing of pain and my willingness to do what I had to to survive. But they also weren't taking into consideration, you know, I was a street kid. I had, like, I've woken up with knives at my throat, full grown men taking everything I have. And then after the ones that have just wanted to rob me left, the ones that were still there kicked the sh me and kicked me around for 20, 30 minutes just for fun. When you go through that sort of sh it kind of makes you have to adapt or you're going to, you know, you either become a little bit more aggressive and more willing to do what you need to to get by or you're gonna get used and abused and end up in a ditch. You know, not all my friends that I made during that time made it out. I have no word to- You know, I was one of those people, I chose to be there. I had a home I could go to, but I was so f***ed up, I didn't want to be there. I tried my best not to take advantage of people or use them or hurt anybody that didn't deserve it. But there's people that weren't as choosy as I was. They were more than willing to chew up those good people. You know, some of them have made it out and I'm blessed that some of my brothers have made it out, but there are a lot more didn't. Wow. I'm, I, no, I, I'm genuinely speechless. Like I, I just, I, it's something I, I can't comprehend. You know, this violence, this is not something I've ha ever had to deal with, like physical violence, people at me physically. Like I just, wow, you're strong. Yeah. but. It's something I put myself into, you know, st stupidly through, you know, the influence of drugs and my own poor decisions, regardless of how young I was when I was exposed. Like, 
I blamed the people that exposed me for a long time, but the reality is I made the choice to be there and I made the choice to take them and I chose to keep taking them and made it that it made it so that they were more important than everything else I was doing. And a lot of people fall into that trap. You know, some people use it as a crutch for trauma. Some people use it just to be numb and ignore everything going on. There's some, some people are just genetically predispositioned like myself for it too. You know, cause I've had people that have had similar struggles, not with, drugs but with like alcohol i had that predisposition for addiction on top of the early exposure and the mental health there were a few older people and people my age that looked out for me and that were like family and that you know throughout all of it we were watching each other's back and i'm more than grateful for them because if it weren't for them i don't think many of us would have made it out if we weren't all solid like that with each other yeah. community is important having each other's backs is generally important you know uh, but in on the streets, you know, people, a lot of people are more worried about how they're getting through the day than their solidarity to you. So you have to really, you learn discernment real quick or you end up really over. You know, by the time I was 18, I've already been shot at. I've been stabbed. I've had people rip me open, my back open with me. I've had to stop confrontations of people going after my roommates with knife me against a group of Four fellas going after my little female roommate and my little buddy. He was like 17 at the time. We had just made it out of the shelter. Me and her had an apartment. He was staying with us because we were trying to help him out. And I don't know what they managed to do to piss these guys off, but I nearly ended up broken, dude. Oh my gosh. You know, like, Whoa. and most people can't even imagine that, you know, like, and that was all like by 18, 19, I'd have been through all that. The only times I had to engage was mostly in self-defense. And I always made sure I called help for the people that were there afterwards. Although I will admit I've had my fair share of getting my kicked in and kicked around. You know, I'm no Superman or invincible by any means, but you know, somebody come at you with, and you've been taught how to defend yourself and, uh, you snap the wrist, are you really at fault? And if you get the medical attention, are you not doing the best you can? And I didn't really think much of it till like, I started reconnecting with some of my old friends within the last couple of years and then them asking about it. And they were sh shocked, only a few of them I kept in contact with throughout my hooligan years. Like some of them knew me when I had gotten my first apartment at like uh, 16, when I finally got off the streets and I had met my baby moms there. And I was on social assistance at the time. I managed to get a place near where they were trying to send me to school at the time while I was dodging the truancy officer. Managed to knock her up when I was 16. Uh, she was 23 at the time. Yeah. Oh my goodness. Just before my 17th birthday, he was born and I was trying to uh, sober up and get everything sorted there. So to clear out the timeline there from... 13 to about 16, I was on the streets and I did three winters outside. I had met my baby moms in the uh, early spring that year we got together. I was with her for a year and a bit till he was born. Me and her split due to her choice of the direction she decided to go with life. You know, I tried to sober up. I got a job. I went back to school. I was doing everything I could. I went back home with my folks for a couple of years. And I raised him, did the three years there with them, got my high school done while, and got a job while, and whatnot while I was raising him. Wow. And uh, then some shit started to pop off with me and my pa. I started, I had studied psychology in school and um, I started reading how the normal mind worked and I started to draw some lines and realize, oh, not exactly normal. And when I brought that up, I was kind of mocked. You know, like my pa was a little bit more old fashioned and he didn't have the same concerns as I did. I ended up breaking down and almost doing something really stupid to him. So I committed myself to the psych ward after being there back home for about three years. So at this point, I'm about 19. And I'm in the psych ward, and uh, when I get out, I'm not welcome back home, for obvious reasons. I don't blame them. You know, I'd be concerned too. 
for the next bit there, I was in uh, a shelter for a little bit, uh, a youth shelter. I went to an adult shelter first. And um, the first night I was there, somebody had attempted to violate me. I woke up when his hands were down, or like trying to pull down my pants. And I turned around, and I punched him in the throat. And he started choking and gagging. And I ran downstairs and told the administration what happened. Um, I asked them to call the cops and they told me that I was confused and that I shouldn't have punched him. And uh, they got me hooked up with a youth shelter nearby. So I grabbed it and I didn't even get all my shit back because I don't know if you know how the shelter systems work, but they make you get rid of most of your shit and it's put under lock and key by them. You don't have access to it so that the other residents can't steal from you because you're living in a big room with people. It's not like you get your own little individual apartment. You're in like a long room with a bunch of bunk beds. I go to the youth shelter. They ask me what I'm doing there because they were like, they were really vague. They just said we needed to take you. I told them what happened and they asked me if I if they wanted me to do something. I was like, you know what, at this point, like I just, I just want to rest. You know, it's been a long day. I was honest with them. I'm going to go smoke a joint. I'll probably be back, you know, and they didn't give me any hassle. They were like, you know what? You go do your thing. We're going to turn a blind eye. And I was so thankful for them. They provided a lot of resources there while I was there. I tried the medication while I was under their uh, supervision there as per the re requirements of being released from the psych ward. And um, they saw and I saw that it was turning me into a zombie and that it wasn't good for me. So they advocated for me to get off. I just started watching people, like the good people around me, the people at the shelters and the soup kitchens and all the other different services I used while I was homeless. I started drawing a pattern and starting, I started trying to build up a, that sort of response and pattern within myself. And when I saw a psychologist a little bit later there, um, they had told me that I had done dialectual behavioral therapy, cognitive behavioral therapy, and some other one just naturally by doing what I did and my, you know, lack of empathy or care, or, you know, consideration that was normal for me because of the disorder. I was able to counteract that with the good examples around me and putting in a conscious effort. Because for me, it was simple. Do I want to continue to be like this and act this way and end up in jail? Or can I try to change what I know is wrong with me, have my freedom and try to be a halfway decent human being? It seems like a pretty simple decision to me. I don't, I like my freedom. <laughs> you know, it sounds selfish and you know, it's not maybe the way that most people would want to hear I'm motivated, but you know, whatever, at least I'm honest. <laughs> Without saying too much of my career path, because on YouTube, I, I like to keep things private. I guess what I'm doing or what I'm going to be pursuing probably is going to involve people in shelters and in people in these situations as well. And I know it can be a heavy, heavy atmosphere, you know, it can be, very stressful and emotionally draining but i do have this motivation and drive to genuinely help people in these situations because i'm able to see the humanity in people even when they mess up you know because there's always a reason behind it you know like we have to look beneath the surface and i'm not it doesn't excuse anybody's behaviors or justify it but there's always a reason you know like i'm always able to see the humanity especially when people want to change like you know why is this happening is it a nature versus nurture thing things like that yeah well when you're dealing with people that are on the streets or in shelters or that are you know come from heavily traumatic backgrounds or you know that have the predispositions to addiction or some of these uh bad behaviors like even myself right i had it was easier for me to get rough with people that got rough with me because i didn't care i liked hurting people but when i was a young kid that was slapped out of me pretty quick you know i had i had to have a way better hold of it till i went to the streets right i've never been a saint but i've definitely tried to minimalize the casualties along the way if people aren't active participants in what's going on with me you know it's not to say that i haven't stolen from like my family or hurt people that were close to me or been in an asshole and lashed out, you know, I'm not proud of it. And it's not that I'm not ashamed of it, but it's part of the stupidity and the, sh the everything I went through that 
it's given me the insight and allowed me to be the person I am today. Exactly. You know, like I'm not proud of it at all. You know, like to to hurt and take from those closest to you and for it to be that easy because inside mentally you just don't care. But it's not an excuse. But I know why it was so easy for me to do it, you know, and I'm not proud of it. And I'm glad I've made a bunch of changes and uh, stuff to make sure that uh, I'm not that kind of person anymore. You know, anybody that knows me knows that I've I've never been a saint, but I've always been solid to those that are my homies. I've always had their backs. I'm always there when people have needed me. I'm trying to strive and make a big a better impact like you were saying with uh, the the path you were wanting to go to since my uh workplace injury and the brain injury there which we'll talk more in depth with in a little bit i've had a lot of free time as i've been going through recovery i've managed to help four people recover and get out of like, drug addiction wow that's amazing yeah wow. so uh, two people that were chemically dependent and uh an alcoholic and somebody that was using it as a tr trauma suppression that just did everything. They didn't care what it was. They were a kitchen sink kind of person. They didn't care what they did. They were just trying to avoid thinking about it. And honestly, I've had these people lash out on me, break down for hours talking to me, pour their whole hearts out and been vulnerable and open in ways that they've never been with anybody else because nobody gives a and the reality is most people don't, but you know, I've been through addiction. I know what that monkey on the shoulders is like, you know, I know what it's like to destroy every social connection you have, ruin every opportunity of work, education, destroy your family. I've done it. I've been there. And I want to help anybody that I can avoid going down into that abyss. Cause I've looked into the heart of it. I've looked into the very depths of that black hole. And it looked back and touched me and I've never been the same. Most people that it touches don't escape with their mind intact. I know people that were on the streets that the, either the they went through or the drugs that they took broke their mind. Schizophrenic or delusional, gone. Thinking that they're like archangels because of their strict Catholic upbringing and the hallucinogenics they did. You know, I've seen people rip open their feet thinking that there's bugs there and trying to stop them. But when there's a six foot eight, 300 pound guy there and you're six, three, 150 soaking wet, how are you gonna stop the guy ripping his foot apart? You help him tend to the wound, but you get him convinced that calling the ambulance is okay and you get him help. But most people can't even imagine. I haven't seen it all, but I've slept under bridges. I've seen, I've been in drug dens and I've also had, mil like I've had millionaires from nearby townships take me into their house. I've sat at tables longer than most houses I've sat in, wearing clothes that weren't mine and suits that were worth more than I've ever gonna make in my life. Thank God to those, the families that took me in and fucking showed me grace while I was uh, on and off during my teenage years and while I was on the streets. I, I've had a very diverse array of experiences. I've been exposed to a lot, whether it be good or bad. I'm blessed for it because I know whether you're a bum or a millionaire, I've ran into people that are dirtier, heartless, and more savage an animal than anything. And they've got more money than I'll ever make. And they think of the same as the homeless man that's willing to do anything for you and give the shirt off your back and show you where the shelter is and where the food kitchen is. will do his best for you. It doesn't matter what, what you have or where you're from. It matters your character. Yes, and thanks, exactly. but I've seen that. And I wouldn't have seen it if I wouldn't have been through what I've been through. Wow, sorry. No, it's okay. I, I wish I could there again. You cried. No, it's okay. Wow. I told you, kid, it's heavy. But it's the kind of shit you learn through experience. It's not something you're going to learn through a book. And I'm not academically stupid either. You know? And I don't need to prove myself to nobody, but I've learned more being on the streets and learning the pu using the public library's computer to learn up, or like research what I've wanted to learn about and through the experiences I had on the street than any school or institutions ever taught me. I believe that. You're, you're right.
It is the experiences we go through. That sort of stuff is what drives me to be there for those people that, like we were talking about, how I've helped a couple people since my brain injury. Those sort of experiences and being through that and know, knowing what it's like makes it why I, I, I want to be there and I go through it. And They know. They know exactly how they treated me and I love them to death. And they know it. I've, they, I've never had to say it to them, but I've shown they know it through my actions. Being there night after night, listening, offering my advice, helping them figure out what things they're doing that aren't conductive to what, where they want to be with their sobriety. Because I've been through it. The bad social influences, not dealing with the traumas or the things that make you want to go and do that. Not having a, somebody to talk to and feeling alone and isolated. Not being active and finding that you actually enjoy doing to try to replace that good feeling that comes from the drugs. Because anybody that's a former addict knows the sh** is euphoric. You know that it gives you a feel, good feel feeling. And when, when you're withdrawing, you feel like sh**. Why do you want to do that? you got to replace it with something else. Like, it's so multifaceted. Some people need help figuring it out that, like, the, their social connections and the people around them aren't good for them. And they need to be told that, shown that, and given ways to that they can test that for themselves. Some people need to be heard out. When you're dealing with that much unresolved emotional, people aren't going to be level-headed. And a lot of people don't give people that grace. That is all for part one, guys. Thank you for watching. Don't forget to leave a like, comment, and subscribe. Come back for part two where we go more in depth about this and Derek talks about his brain injury and where he is today. Thanks again and I'll see you guys in part two.